A couple of weeks ago, it was announced that James Gunn would be writing a sequel to Suicide Squad. Also, he might be directing. Also, it might be a reboot. It's unclear. And one of my favorite of my own videos is on how I believe the original Suicide Squad could have been done differently to make a more interesting movie that was better tailored to the fundamentals of the Suicide Squad. It's called Saving Captain Boomerang. I think it's a lot of fun. And in that video, I try to work around the constraints of the original Suicide Squad, same characters, similar mission. But this time, I want to do something different. I want to pitch what I would do with Suicide Squad. If I were in James Gunn's shoes, what would my version look like? And a pitch of a movie like Suicide Squad centers around two things, the squad and the mission. So let's start with the squad. My version would be a soft reboot. So I'm keeping Flag, Deadshot, and Captain Boomerang. I think all of those characters more or less worked, and they're all classic members of the Suicide Squad. I would like Harley back, but I'm not sure where that character will be in a few years, since in the end of Suicide Squad, Joker broke her out of prison, and Harley is going to be part of the new Birds a Prey movie, so I doubt Harley Quinn is going to end up in jail again for Suicide Squad 2 and then get broken out of jail again for Birds of Prey 2, so I'm writing this without her. In Harley's place, we will have the first new member of the squad, Killer Frost. This Killer Frost is Caitlin Snow, the Killer Frost in the new 52 comics relaunch from a few years ago. She's a scientist who, through an accident, was transformed into an ice vampire. Frost needs to steal heat from other people to survive. She can freeze water, creating walls and weapons and all kinds of things. She's really powerful. And originally, Snow didn't know what to do with her power. She tried to cure herself, but it didn't work. And eventually, she was forced to kill people to survive. This got the attention of some heroes, and Snow was caught and brought to Bell Rev, where Amanda Waller offered her an opportunity. Snow could continue her research into a cure as long as she would participate in missions as part of Task Force X. And while on the mission, Snow would be able to kill targets and steal their heat energy. It was a win-win. The second new squatter is a character named Bet Sanchoa, who goes by the code name Plastique. She doesn't have any superpowers, but Sanchoa is one of the world's foremost experts on explosives. Originally a French terrorist, Plastique was part of a bombing that was foiled by Batman, and after she was captured, she was recruited to Task Force X by Waller. Plastique takes things a little more seriously than her other squad members, but does get along with the team, especially Deadshot, who she respects. Third new squatter is a fan favorite character named King Shark. You may be familiar with Shark from my Justice League rewrite. He's going to be taking the place of Killer Croc on the team. Let's just say Killer Croc died on a mission between the original Suicide Squad and this one, but luckily another mutant swimming monster guy showed up. It's no secret that I don't like the Killer Croc from the original Suicide Squad, so I think it makes sense rather than rebooting Killer Croc just to replace him with a new character, King Shark. Shark is just a big street shark dude who towers over the rest of the team. The character would be completely CGI. If we couldn't pull that off, I don't think it would be worth it to have King Shark in the movie, and I would recommend replacing him with someone like Blockbuster. King Shark is the team's muscle, but he also has a heart of gold and everyone loves him, except Boomerang, who is jealous of King Shark's popularity. New squatter number four is a character named Peter Merkel, also known as Ragdoll. He's weird. The other squatters don't really get along with Merkel. He's a contortionist who can sneak past almost any barrier. Ragdoll was originally a circus performer, but when the circus he worked at closed, Ragdoll couldn't find another job, so he became homeless. Ragdoll committed some petty crimes, but was eventually caught and brought to prison. And finally, we have the eighth member of Task Force X. He is the highest profile member of the Suicide Squad that didn't make it into the original movie, and for that reason, I would make him the main character of this movie, a character named Ben Turner, otherwise known as the Bronze Tiger. So in my opinion, Bronze Tiger is easily the most compelling member of the team. He has a pretty simple backstory. Bronze Tiger is basically Batman with two big differences. First is that Ben Turner is African American. His race isn't going to be a huge part of this story, but it is a pretty noticeable difference between him and Batman. So when Ben was young, Ben's parents were murdered, and Ben dedicated his life to ridding the streets of crime so that no other kid would have to deal with that loss. Very Batman. He traveled to Asia and spent a decade mastering pretty much every discipline of martial arts. Again, very Batman. But in the comics, Bronze Tiger is one of, if not the greatest martial artist in the DC universe. And since DCEU Batman isn't an especially skilled fighter, Bronze Tiger would beat him no question. Turner even trained with the League of Assassins for a while, but left the League when he refused to kill an innocent person, again, very Batman. So Turner returned to Central City to fight crime under the name the Bronze Tiger. At this point, Flash wasn't a costumed crime fighter, so Central City was the perfect place to start since it has a ton of supervillains. And Turner stopped a bunch of them, maybe a couple of named ones who won't figure into any big Flash movie in the future. Turner caught the Trickster and the Shade. And one day, Turner was foiling a bank robbery by a character named Girder. Girder is a pretty simple villain. He's a metahuman with color 
Colossus powers, he could turn his whole body into metal, and Bronze Tiger managed to beat Girder. But before he could escape, Bronze Tiger and Girder were both captured by the police. That's the other big difference between Bronze Tiger and Batman. Bronze Tiger is Batman if he got caught. Turner stands trial, and even though it's clear that Turner was trying to help stop Girder, there are a lot of anti-vigilante laws on the books, most of them in place because of Batman, and Turner is sentenced to 20 years in prison. And when Turner is brought to Iron Heights, Waller attempts to recruit Turner to join Task Force X, but Turner turns her down. Turner has accepted that he broke the law and needs to pay his debt to society. Waller says, fine, but if you change your mind, call me. And then, the next day, there's a breakout. This is the DC Universe, so it isn't all that uncommon. A bunch of prisoners escape, including Girder. Turner sees Girder escape and it makes him angry. Turner is only in prison because he tried to stop Girder, and now he's going to serve 20 years in prison while Girder is out on the street committing more crimes. So he calls Waller. And wouldn't you know it, Waller has a mission. She assembles the squad, they all meet, most of them are pretty happy to see each other. They all get along since between the original Suicide Squad and now, Task Force X has been on a bunch of missions, and they've all got a pretty good rapport. Bronze Tiger is not cool with this. He didn't realize he would be on a team with robbers and terrorists and hitmen. He immediately butts heads with everyone, but then Waller shows up. And then we get the mission. So there's this general named Wade Eiling. Smart guy, well-respected, he used to work with Waller. But when Superman showed up, Eiling didn't trust Superman. Especially, like, near the end of Man of Steel when Superman takes down a Predator drone because he doesn't want the government spying on him. General Eiling didn't like that Superman wasn't playing for his team. Superman made his own rules. And yeah, Superman was on America's side now. But if Superman broke with the government and decided to do things his own way, there'd be no way to stop him. Eiling grew up during the Cold War, and he believed superpowers need to be put in check by other superpowers. It's basically Hopper's argument from the original Suicide Squad. What if Superman had decided to grab the President of the United States right out of the Oval Office? Who would have stopped him? We're finally going to deliver on that admittedly ridiculous premise. And Eiling started researching possible ways to stop Superman. Originally, it was just scientific, and when the President got wind of it, he shut it down. The President trusted and liked Superman, so he didn't want the fact that the government was researching anti-Superman measures to get leaked and make Superman not trust the government anymore. But Eiling kept researching, and he started looking into more unorthodox methods. Ancient relics, stuff of myths. And he became obsessed with something called the Spear of Destiny. It's the spear that pierced the side of Jesus during the crucifixion. Legend has it, the spear gives its wielder godlike powers, including the ability to control minds. So the government finds out about Eiling's research and he is discharged, thrown out of the military. And then he disappears. No one hears from him for a few years. Until one day, Waller gets a letter from a retired army captain named Nathaniel Adams. Which is strange because Captain Adams is dead. Died two years ago in a car crash. And the letter tells Waller that Captain Adams is one of a group of soldiers that General Island convinced to go with him on a quest to find the Sphere of Destiny. The soldiers are following a map that Island stole from the government and are currently in the middle of the Congo. Captain Adams contacted Waller because he believes General Island has gone insane, and if the spear exists and Island is able to find it, the general could become the most powerful person on Earth and go on a metahuman killing spree. So Task Force X is on a mission to travel to the heart of the African jungle, track down General Island, and kill the general before he can find the spear. Basically, it's Apocalypse Now, but with superpowers. And I don't want to give away the entire story, but there are a few fun beats we have to hit. When they enter the jungle, the squad is going to encounter a group of warlords. That's the first big fight. And when one of the heroes is cornered by the warlords, a hero named Mari McCabe, also known as Vixen, is going to save them. Vixen owns a totem that lets her access all of the powers of the animals. It's an interesting power. She's fast, strong, stuff like that. Vixen is in the neighborhood, also trying to deal with these warlords. And once she hears about what the squad's doing, Vixen is going to help the team get through the jungle. They're going to find Eiling, and Ragdoll's going to attempt to assassinate Eiling, but Eiling's going to catch Ragdoll, and Waller is going to detonate the explosive that she uses to threaten the team members in Ragdoll's neck in an attempt to kill the general. But the general will survive, and this will be the moment we learn he already has the spear. Eiling was anticipating that the Suicide Squad would show up, but instead of killing them, Eiling is going to use the spear's powers to disable the bombs, freeing the squad members, and give them a choice. Help the general, or die. Frost and Plastique will switch sides and work with the general. The general will also learn that Adams betrayed him, 
him and use the spear to turn Adams into a being of pure energy who he will call Captain Adam. The spear will allow the general to control Captain Adam and the general will have Captain Adam fight the remaining squad members. Basically, it's a story about redemption and morality. Bronze Tiger doesn't trust the rest of the squad because they're criminals. But can this mission teach Bronze Tiger that there's more to these criminals than the crimes they committed? And can a former hero work with a bunch of bad guys to save the world? So I hope you guys liked the pitch. Let me know what you thought in the comments. This is the first video like this, so I am legitimately curious. As always, thank you to all my patrons. You guys are the best. I thought about making this video a while back, but I decided to do it this week because of a poll I put up on Patreon. So if you want to be able to vote on polls like that, see your name up here and get access to videos early, throw in literally any amount of money at patreon.com slash nandovmovies. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. Also, subscribe to my Twitter and Instagram and subreddit and Discord, whichever one of those you use. Subscribe or follow that. I use them for announcements. For instance, next week, my good friend and mostly nitpicking podcast co-host DJ is hosting an Extra Life Gaming Marathon fundraiser. I'll be at that for a bit of it, so if you want to find out when I'll be there, those platforms are a good way to figure that out. I'm Nando V Movies on all of them. Subscribe, support the channel, and keep watching and sharing videos. I really love making these, and I'm so happy that you guys have enjoyed them so far. That's all I got. I'll see you next time.